Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night uh, teaching. Today what we wanted to do, uh, I've had two or three people this last week asked about uh, the Essene beliefs, uh, doctrines, and a little bit of their history and how they got started and things like that. So I wanted to kind of revisit that. Uh, we have been growing quite a bit. Uh, so we have a lot of new people that have come along. We, we've got a uh, a good number of teachings in our YouTube channel, which uh, you can go back and see some of the things we've done. Um, but it does take a long time to get through those. So I thought today would be a good time just to go back through uh, the Essene teachings, uh, just to kind of see the whole idea. Basically, you've got Essenes, and you've got Pharisees, and you've got Sadducees. And in the Bible, uh, you have specifically, those are the three big ones, but there's several other subgroups. In the Bible, there's Samaritans, there's uh, Essenes, or scribes, there's Pharisees and Sadducees, and then there's Zealots. Uh, along with the Zerots, Zealots, there were Sakari and a few other subgroups. Uh, basically, uh, the Samaritans... Uh, were a people that came in that started worshiping the Lord when one of the sets of tribes were taken out. This was done by the Assyrians. So what happens is you've got these people that have the five books of Moses and are told or come to believe for some reason that the canon is closed. Uh, you can't add to God's word anymore. We're done. And it was interesting, I don't know if you saw it or not, but last week they had an episode of The Chosen where Jesus was in Samaria and he was healing people, doing things. And so the leader asked him to come into the synagogue and preach. So they go in there and they have actually five books on the table, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And that's it. And they begin to have this conversation. John comes in. John makes the comment, oh, they are missing so much. And Jesus says, yes, they are. Well, let's start with Genesis, you know, and he goes out and preaches a sermon. Um, so that's interesting, but we have different ideas like that. So the Samaritans would say, this is the Bible. This is what we believe. The other stuff may or may not be accurate history. Uh, we don't care. It shouldn't be added to the Bible. Jews, on the other hand, would say, no, no, There's it continues. The succession of prophets teach that these things should be added to the canon. And it continues up. So that's one major thing. Today we see Catholics having a few more books than Protestants do. We see the Eastern Orthodox having Psalm 151 and a couple of books that the, I think it's 3rd and 4th Maccabees, uh, that the Catholics don't have. And then you see uh, other subgroups, certain Orthodox groups, having more or less of that in their canon. That's just one issue. But basically, Orthodox or Orthodox, Catholic or Catholic, Protestants or Protestants. But it's just interesting to look at. So with that in mind, I mean, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. That's obvious. Uh, but we go back to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. They all claim to be the original representation of uh, Moses and the law of Moses is given by God and everybody else is apostate because, and somebody's changed their doctrine. That's for sure. Um, if we were all part of a Baptist church that believes in believers baptism by immersion, and somehow we got three subgroups out of the deal. Some of them don't believe in baptism. Others believe in baptism by sprinkling. Others believe in baptism by immersion. Others say it's symbolic of something else, you know. And so you've got these four groups then of Baptists that believe they are the true doctrine all the way back. Uh, the same kind of thing is happening with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. We know from scriptures, though, that the Sadducees believed that there is no angels and there's no resurrection. Um, and so, obviously, looking at the scriptures, you can tell that they've apostatized. That, that's not biblical. There's no way that they would believe that, that kind of a thing, or that the original Jews would. Uh, so, what's going on then is we go to the, the Pharisees, and they are very, very biblical-minded. They believe in the scriptures. They believe in life after death. They believe in the resurrection. They believe in heaven and hell. They believe in following the word of God waiting for Messiah. Uh, but then 
they start interpreting things by the oral Torah, which is an extra set of, uh, of uh, books, basically. Now, as a Christian, I'm going to interpret the Old Testament by what the New Testament tells me. So when Isaiah, for instance, says, uh, this is a sign, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you'll call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Uh, that sounds like a virgin birth. The Pharisees say that based on our oral Torah, for instance, that means something else. There isn't such thing as a real virgin birth. Well, when we get to Matthew, though, Matthew said that Mary was a virgin. She'd never been married, never had a child, never been with a man. That's a virgin. But she would conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit and give birth to the Messiah. Now, that story, then, with all that detail, doesn't leave any room for doubt. It's a virgin birth. And then Matthew said this fulfills that prophecy out of Isaiah. So the New Testament believers, for instance, just taking this one doctrine, believed that Isaiah is prophesying a virgin birth. The Pharisees, on the other hand, would admit that it kind of looks that way, but their oral Torah says it means something else. So as a Christian, going by the New Testament, I'm going to say the Pharisees are wrong, at least on that one doctrine. Okay, and they keep coming up with other doctrines or teachings about the Messiah that contradict the New Testament. Uh, so I'm just going to hang out there. Uh, so Sadducees are out of the picture. Pharisees seem to be godly, but have some very strange teachings on the Old Testament. And we didn't know much about the Essenes until the Dead Sea Scrolls come along. And in the 1990s, almost up to late 1990s, Finally, their, their history and theology, uh, their community rule, things like that came out to the public. And so now we know what they teach. As you would expect, the Essenes say, we are the original Jews. And the Pharisees say, no, no, we are the original Jews. You're a cult. No, you're a cult. No, you're a cult. That's kind of the way it went. Um, but again, as a Christian, I'm looking at the New Testament just, just the basic stuff that we would all agree on. If you if you believe the Old Testament, the New Testament is true, then you'd believe in a virgin birth because it's very clear in Matthew. You'd believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. That's very clear in like Matthew 28. So these things would be interpreted that way. Well, it turns out then that the Essenes believed the same as we do. And they interpret that. We've talked about that uh, several times. One of the best documents for that is 11Q13, called the Melchizedek document. It actually says that Melchizedek uh, is God incarnate. Okay, And he comes to earth to die for our sins, to forgive us of the debt of our iniquities. And then it turns around and says that event would occur in 32 AD. Um, and several other points to it. So it's a very, very amazing document. So the Messiah doesn't, that, that particular document doesn't say anything about a virgin birth, uh, but there are other Dead Sea Scrolls that do. And so we wanted to kind of look at that tonight just a little bit, just kind of re-looking at these things. And this is one reason why Israel now becomes a, a nation. The Dead Sea Scrolls come to pass, you know, or, or become public. And I believe that to be a prophecy of Isaiah 29. Uh, but anyway, when you're surrounded by people that said, Jews never used to be here, you're liars, get out, this is our land, you never used to be here. And then you dig up in the dirt Hebrew Old Testament scriptures, that pretty much proves that the Jews used to be there. I mean, there's really no way around that. Uh, sometime, anyway, they used to be there. And so with the landscape and the Dead Sea Scrolls, it pretty much proves that the Jews have a right to be in their land. So that's, of course, what they would really camp out on. They would want everyone to know about the Dead Sea Scrolls because it's their key to proving they own the land. Interesting thing about that, then, is if that proves that that's their land because it's their ancestors that wrote it, we need to listen to what their ancestors said. Now, their ancestors tell the story of the Essenes being the original Jews and the Pharisees being basically a cult or a cutoff of proper doctrine. So let's start off by looking at this. I made a chart, and I thought you would be uh, interested in this. Uh, a ways back, and I'm going to add to this, but 
hopefully you can see this okay um some of the basic issues and what the sadducees the pharisees and the essenes see so we've got the sadducees in the first column pharisees in the second and essenes in the third so under the issues uh final authority so who is the final authority for sadducees it would be the government because the sadducees believe that there is no resurrection there is no holy spirit we'll see that in a minute um so once you're dead you're dead if that's true why would i want to die early and if i can just do whatever i'm told and not have a problem and live a nice long life no matter what happens to other people that's what i should do and so that was the basic concept of the Sadducees, final form of the government. Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in the resurrection of the body, uh, a heaven and a hell. So if that's true, I don't want to live a nice long life of an extra 10 years and then spend my eternity in the lake of fire. That's not a good idea. So we don't uh, submit our the final authorities, not the local government, the Romans, the you know, whoever is the Seleucid Empire, it would actually be um, scripture. But again, what they, they, wa they want to make it very, very clear uh, what they believe in this concept of an oral law or oral Torah comes up. So for instance, if Pharisees and Sadducees are debating, it should be done this way, no, it should be done this way. If they can come up with an oral quote uh, that nobody's heard before, but Moses told us orally all the way down. Therefore, Moses said, you do it our way. Well, that's that's pretty convincing if you didn't think it was made up. Um, so that's the, the concept, the oral Torah. And I'm not saying that the oral Torah is all lies. It's probably 90% correct. Uh, the Old Testament tells us things like we need to, the Jews, the Levites rather, need to sacrifice animals. Well, that's fine, and I'm not a Levite, so I wouldn't do that. But if I was going to do that, how would I do that? Do I have to say a certain prayer, stand facing the east? How do I actually slaughter the animal? There's a lot of details that aren't given in the Old Testament. So that's where this oral law would come from. So there's a lot of that and a lot of history, probably correct, if it's just telling history. But in the midst of this is going to be all these ideas that aren't quite right so oral law now the Essenes would say we base our understanding of the Old Testament by the writings of the patriarchs so their concept is um, remember again let's go back to my my concept of Isaiah Isaiah said a virgin will conceive and bear a son and you'll call his name Emmanuel well maybe virgin means the word Alma there in Hebrew maybe that means something else who knows? That would be the concept. Well, the Pharisees would say, we know it means something else because our oral Torah says so. The Essenes would say, who cares? When you're dead, you're dead. Don't worry about it. Just be obedient. Um, the Essenes, on the other hand, would say, we know that it means a virgin birth because the writings of the patriarch say that's what it is. As a Christian, I'm going to say, I know it's a virgin birth because that's what Matthew says it is. And I go by the old, the New Testament, rather. New Testament hadn't been written yet. So we'll take a peek at these patriarchs. But basically, the concept is from Adam down to Aaron, all the patriarchs wrote a last will and testament. And many of these have been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so we've tried to pull those together. We'll look at those in a minute. But you can kind of see that. We're not trying to add to Scripture. They're not added to the canon. As a matter of fact, they could can be considered a pre-Mosaic canon, like a canon for the first age, whereas Moses' writing in the Old Testament is the canon for the second age, New Testament canon for the third age. Maybe there will be a kingdom one. Uh, whether they looked at it or not, they looked at it as a high regard and authority. But what, what makes it interesting is the more we delve into the Messiah, um, history, prophecy, things like that, the more we realize the Sadducees are way out out of the picture pharisees have a form of godliness but don't have a clue or deliberately lied to change something that's what it seems like uh some of them anyway i'm sure there was a lot of really good pharisees anyway the essenes then follow this patriarchal teaching and that apparently the more we look at it 
is identical with New Testament theology. So with that in mind, as, as Christians, if we believe the New Testament, which one of these three groups would you say is the original doctrine or the original teaching? And I would go with the scenes. So let's go on with this then. So the final authority we would say is not the government or the oral Torah, but the patriarchs. Priestly code, for instance, who's supposed to follow the priestly code? So like the book of Leviticus, if you, um, uh, so you got to say the prayers just right. You've got to uh, um, drink the, the wine in a certain way, a certain kind of wine. You've got to make it a certain way. Is that for everybody, for Jews, for priests, people on duty? Is it a, What kind of a thing is it? So the Sadducees would say, and, and this is interesting how the history, how it came about, but it's for everyone. So in other words, a Jew, a Gentile, a man, a woman, a priest, a non-priest, you have to follow all these things. And we can see things like this in um, in um, in Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, for instance, when the Jesus was coming back, they went through a cornfield or a wheat field, and the the, the uh, disciples started picking some corn and eating it. Well, the Pharisees objected and say, "Why do you let them to do this? Why don't you teach them to observe?" the tradition of the elders which is this oral law right here the pharisee tradition of the elders and jesus said because and, you know he could have very easily said because they're not priests do you know the difference between the temple and a cornfield we're standing in a cornfield it's not hard to figure out of course they would have said you're not supposed to uh pick corn on the sabbath or whatever no, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Their profession is not picking corn. They're not picking it to make money. We're coming home from church, basically, and we're hungry, and here's an apple or, or something. Pick it and eat it. That's not breaking. The, this tradition of the elders would say you're breaking the law, not the Old Testament. So it's that kind of a thing. So the priestly code then is for everyone. The Pharisees would say, well, it's for all Jews. It's not for Gentiles, so we all understand that, but it's for all Jews. The Essenes would say it's for the priests. So wearing the, phyl the phylacteries, you know, the teflon, uh, the tzitzit, things like that, are for rabbis or priests or people working in the temple, or even the normal Jew going into the temple to do something on, a, on the Feast of Tabernacles or something like that. But not for other people. As a matter of fact, even the oral, uh, or not oral, but the Orthodox today would tell you that it's uh, it's a sin, for instance, for a woman to wear the tzitzit, that's the tassels, or a yarmulke, or a teflon, or anything like that, because women are not supposed to wear men's clothes. So that's why it's forbidden. Uh, and it's interesting over here, we see a lot of Messianic churches with the, the ladies having coverings on their head and and uh, wearing the Teflon and the things like that. And it's it's very disrespectful, according to the Israelis today. If you went and did that in Israel, you'd be highly reprimanded. So anyway, difference in this. So priestly code, everybody, just Jews or just priests. So it's really interesting. Uh, forced Gentile circumcision. Should Gentiles be forced to convert? And if you're living in Israel, should you be forced to be circumcised? And Sadducees would say, yes, in Israel, because they have no authority outside of Israel. But everybody living in Israel should be forced to be circumcised. Um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees both said no. Circumcision is when you want to convert. And if you're not wanting to convert to Judaism, to stay a Noahide or whatever, or even a, like a Roman, uh, they're not to be forced to convert. Now, this falls in line with what Paul says, because he talks about in uh, Corinthians, this is the rule that I lay down in every church. If you're circumcised, don't seek uncircumcision. If you're uncircumcised, do not seek circumcision. Follow the, the way that you were born. And then he actually makes mention, as it's interesting, he says, because it's important, uh, circumcision or uncircumcision, doesn't matter what matters is following the law of god which shows that circumcision is a law of moses so again you may or may not disagree or agree with these but these are the differences in the concepts
Noahide law. Um, so the concept that Gentiles follow the seven Noahide laws, they're not supposed to follow the priestly uh, rituals or other rituals that Jews do. For instance, there's 613 laws according to Maimonides, but about 400 of them uh, pertain to the priesthood. And since none of us, even if we converted to Judaism, would be able to become a Levitical priest, go into a rebuilt temple since there isn't one and start doing sacrifices. So with that in mind, there's 400 or so of those laws that are impossible for anyone to do. And even if we had a Levitical priesthood, any rebuilt temple, and it was all up and going, and maybe I married into a Levitical family, then maybe my children might, you know, be able to do that, but not me. See, that would be uh, against the law of Moses. So Noahide law, uh, nothing is mentioned about that as far as fa Pharisees or Sadducees go, but Sa Pharisees and Essenes both believe in Noahide law. There's a difference between a Noahide court and a Gentile, I mean a Jewish court. Uh, the main focus, I thought this was interesting, the Sadducees' main focus is on social issues. This sounds really interesting if you kind of put a lot of our churches together here, do whatever the government tells you, if you can't go to church, you can't go to church. Um, we don't want to go to hell. So other people, whatever. Social issues are most important. We, we want everybody to get along, everybody to be fed, everything. Well, if the churches are doing what they're supposed to, they would be feeding the poor and doing, it would be done. It wouldn't be an issue. But social issue and social injustice, so focused on that you forget the other points is sinful okay and so the pharisees are a little closer to home their main idea is doctrine they don't care so much about social issues but are you following the doctrine now that would be perfect if they followed the doctrine as taught in the in the old testament or like we would in the new but if you're going by man-made traditions this is going to be really messed up and everybody recognized that. They kind of hated the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They loved the Essenes, though. Essenes focused on prophecy, and I think that's really important. Yes, uh, make sure that you don't sin. Stop sinning, because sin will hurt you. You, you don't want to mess yourself up. You know, don't, don't eat until you're huge and have a heart attack. Don't smoke cigarettes until you get lung cancer. Don't drink so much of alcohol that you get a cirrhotic liver. There are things that you should do and things that you shouldn't do. Get some mild exercise, eat a proper balanced diet, you know, things like that. So don't hurt yourself in any way. But the focus is what is God doing? Not for me, but what is his plan? When is the first coming? When is the second coming? How do I prepare for it? What should we be doing? What do the prophets say about this? Yeah, the moral issues are important, but they're pretty straightforward. I shouldn't steal. Okay, I got that. I shouldn't fornicate. Okay, I got that. I may not like it, but I got that. I shouldn't murder people. Okay, I, that's pretty self-explanatory. I got that. What about prophecy? Well, there's riddles. Well, let's study them. So this was the whole concept. What's interesting is if you were uh, a Gentile or a woman or even worse, a Gentile woman, <laughs> and you were in Israel back in those days, Sadducees, um, do we have this in here? Yeah, uh, under demeanor, basically. Uh, the Sadducees would be extremely unfriendly to anyone who's a Gentile or a Jew who's not of their order. They're very clicky, clickish. Uh, Pharisees would be friendly to Jews, all Jews, you know, but you got to follow their weird traditions or they'll yell at you. But Gentiles out of the picture convert or get out. Essenes, on the other hand, are friendly to everyone. If you're not interested in the things of God, go away, leave me alone. I'm not going to bother you. If you come to an Essene and say, I'm a believer in Messiah, does Messiah, what, what do you know of Messiah? Can we talk about Messiah? The Essene would stop and sit down and talk with you. And like it says in the school of Elijah, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, a Jew or a Gentile, you want to know Messiah, we'll get to know Messiah. Let's sit down and talk. So, you know, you may or may not become a priest, or you can't become a priest, may or may not become a prophet, but 
And that's what's interesting, too, because Nathan was, as far as I know, the only Gentile prophet. He never converted. He's forbidden to convert because he's a Netan, which is a Gibeonite. The Gibeonites, remember when Joshua was coming into the land, pretended they were from a long ways away and they wanted to come and make peace because they were scared they were going to get killed. So the ruling was made that they can exist, they can be with them, but they can't intermingle. They can't ever convert to Judaism. They can't ever intermarry with Jews. They can't ever do it. They have to be, they're segregated. Now, the Gibeonites, one of the Gibeonites much later was a guy named Nathan who was baptized in the Holy Spirit, became a prophet, and he was a Gentile prophet that taught King David how to be the greatest Jewish king that's ever been. So it's an interesting dichotomy. You can see this all the way through these things, that there's there's a difference between Jews and Gentiles. Be one or the other, and you can convert, you can do whatever, but be one or the other. Don't confuse people. So this is the demeanor of that. But back up here then, if the focus then, I thought is interesting is on prophecy, and that's where a lot of us are. Um, eternal life and the resurrection. Again, it's been said in the New Testament that the Sadducees didn't believe in eternal life or in the resurrection or in angels, that kind of thing. Pharisees and Essenes both did, of course, because they take the scriptures literally. The Messiah. Who is the Messiah? Pharisees said he's only a man. There's no doctrine, I don't think, from a Sadducee document that I know of but I would imagine he's pro they're probably along the line of the Pharisee idea. Essenes say, no, he's God incarnate. The patriarchs said so. So no problem. And you kind of see that in Isaiah, being, the being born of a virgin, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, one Messiah with two comings, or two Messiahs and one coming, or that was a big debate in the first century. Again, Sadducees... It doesn't matter because they're just men anyway. Um, Pharisees say, no, there's not one Messiah with two comings. There's actually two separate Messiahs, a Messiah ben David and a Messiah ben Joseph. The Essenes, on the other hand, said, no, no, no. There's one Messiah. He comes to die for our sins. Uh, somehow he, you know, it's speculative, but he must, if he dies and then rules forever. How does that work? Well, he has to die. Apparently there's a resurrection. Everybody believes in the resurrection, so that's not difficult to figure out. Apparently he goes away for a while and comes back. So, you know, uh, so the one Messiah, two comings. The Holy Spirit, does the Holy Spirit exist? Is the Holy Spirit part of a trinity? Is the Holy Spirit an angel? Is it just a word for stuff? You know, what do you, what do you say? Uh, the Sadducees said that the Holy Spirit did not exist. So when you see in the New Testament, people would say things like, um, how were you baptized? You know, I, you know, uh, I think it was Apollos that said, we, we don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. Well, how were you baptized? John's baptism, baptism of repentance. Oh, you guys need to become a Christian then. You're kind of halfway there. You're baptized by an Essene looking for the Messiah but you don't know much about the Messiah. Let's introduce you to him, and let's introduce you to the Holy Spirit. So you can tell these guys probably came from a Sadducee background and then, you know, studied under John. Uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees both said the Holy Spirit exists. What I think is interesting now, a modern-day Orthodox, some of the Orthodox Jews will say the Holy Spirit exists, but they don't look at the Holy Spirit as a person or an angel or anything like that. They tend to call it a lower form of prophecy. And I have no idea what that even means. But anyway, um, the Essenes made it clear that there's God the Father, Hashem. When the Messiah comes, somehow he down here as a human is God incarnate, although God is still up there. So I don't know how that works. And then there's the Holy Spirit that guides the prophets. And then there are angels and there's humans and animals and plants and all sorts of things. So they don't use a concept to say Trinity, but you can see it taught in their writings, even back like in the book of Gad and, and several other things. So it's really interesting. Do angels exist? Sadducees said no. 
Pharisees and Essenes have said, yes, of course they do. They're all through the Old Testament. Uh, gifts and the prophets. This is interesting to me. Many of you today may maybe have went to a charismatic or a Pentecostal church that say all the gifts function. And maybe you've went to another church uh, that's not Pentecostal, and maybe they say none of the gifts function anymore. It's all ceased. It's all been done away with. And a lot of people are kind of in, in between. Maybe they think that, you know, God sometimes heals, but there's no tongues or vice versa or something. Well, what's interesting is we all agree as Christians that the gifts flowed in the first century. There was the prophet Agabus. Uh, the disciples healed people. So the gifts were there in the first century. So with that in mind, whether you think it's here now or not, it was in the first century of the Christian era. So with that in mind, then, before the Christians, this is what's interesting, because the Sadducees and the Pharisees both said, no, the gifts and the prophets and the prophecies, the gifts of the Spirit, that all ceased. It doesn't happen anymore. And that I thought that was really interesting. The Essenes said, no, they continue. The Essenes are known by the uh, Jews as being prophets that were 100% accurate in their prophecies. And they understood the biblical prophecies perfectly by the Holy Spirit, but they also had extra biblical prophecies and were always 100% accurate. And these guys loved the community. And they would sit down with you and talk about prophecy and what God expects of you if you're Jewish or Gentile or a man or a woman or whatever. And so it's really interesting. The people called the Essenes the saints. The Sadducees and the Pharisees are, yeah, they sit in the seat of Moses. That's all we'll say. And that's, that was their attitude for them. And you can understand why. But today it's interesting to me because, you know, the, in their day, the, the Essenes would have then been thought of as those wacky charismatics. Don't know if they spoke in tongues or not, but as believing in the gifts and prophecy and healings and those wacky weirdos, you know, I'd rather hang out with the Pharisees that are calm and whew, nice and even that understand that God can't do that anymore. But it's interesting. If the gifts existed and the Essenes said they existed, and then John the Baptist comes, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is given, and the first century church starts, and from then on, according to the early church fathers, the gifts continue, but only in believers of Messiah. So it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Gentile. If you believe in Messiah and you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, which you'd have to believe in Messiah to do that, then the gifts are there. If you're a believer in the laws of Moses and you've rejected Jesus as Messiah, you don't have any gifts. It's really interesting. That's what the first, first century church fathers said. So to me, it's interesting because it really looks like if your doctrine gets off and you get socially minded and forget about what God wants you to do as a person, you're not going to experience gifts and you're going to really assume that gifts have stopped. That is really interesting. Now, maybe they have or haven't in our time period, but I'm just saying it's really interesting. So now, among the churches that say the gifts have stopped, are they really doing a great work for the Lord? Now, granted, there's always been wacky charismatics. There's been people that fake healings, stuff like that. But we're talking about what God is doing, not what weirdos are doing. Okay, patriarchal testaments. They're rejected by the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but accepted by the Essenes. Now, what's interesting about the patriarchal testaments is that um, everybody, everybody acknowledges that they existed. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, even the early church fathers, they all said, yeah, apparently these things did exist, but don't know where they're at. Or they've probably just been destroyed. Uh, who knows, you know, that kind of thing. And what's interesting to me is if my grandfather was a prophet of God and wrote down his thoughts, his feelings, what he thought God was telling him, his prophecies in a book, and I'm not going to take it as gospel 100% truth, but if he was known to be a prophet and prayed for people and people got healed, and there's my father's memoirs or my grandfather's, 
I'm going to keep that. If it starts getting war torn, I'm going to make copies of it. I'm going to digitize it and put it on the internet. I'm, I don't want to lose that. That's my grandfather. And I'm sure they would have felt the same way. So what happened to your grandfather's notes? Oh, I don't know. They must have disappeared somewhere. Somebody wanted them to disappear because of what grandfather said. That's what's interesting about it. So again, if, if these guys are Jewish, their theology, their interpretation of the Old Testament is just like us Christians because we believe the New Testament and they believe it because of the patriarchal writings. That's something we need to look at and we need to share with our Jewish brothers so that they can come to understand Messiah. Oral Torah is rejected by the Sadducees, accepted by the Pharisees, and it's rejected by the Essenes, of course, the tradition of the elders. So this is just kind of a small um, chart to kind of go along with this. So let's take a peek uh, at the patriarchal testaments. When uh, About three years ago, I started going through the Dead Sea Scrolls really heavy. And when I came to understand this as their basis for their understanding, it's like if you go to a Baptist church, you have a Baptist faith and message, I think. It's like a... Um, a thing saying what you as a Baptist believe and what you do. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, maybe it doesn't matter and somebody can do it a different way. But you as a denomination do it this way. Okay, so the patriarchal testaments are what the Essenes would do, as opposed to the oral Torah is what the Pharisees would do. So there's a lot of these in here. And just going through here, there, there should be some at least 40, if not more, maybe 70, according to some text. But, for instance, uh, the Testaments. We have a piece of the Testament of Enos. Now, remember, Adam, Seth, Enos. This is Adam's grandson. Actually has a Testament. And it's badly fragmented, but there's a piece of it talking about God and Messiah and things like that. So they knew a Messiah would come and save them. We don't have anything from Adam, for instance, but we do have a quote from Josephus quoting Adam's testament. Just one little piece. It was about uh, the, the uh, judgments that are coming, uh, one by fire and one by a flood of water, but he didn't know which one was going to come first. But he, just, but he did understand that much, and that was part of his testament. So really interesting. Lamech and then Noah... Noah's testament is amazing. It explains a lot. Uh, Abraham's testament is pretty interesting, too. And then you've got Jacob, very small piece of it. And then you've got the 12 children, uh, Reuben down to Benjamin. Now, these have existed in Greek for the longest time. People thought of them as fiction because the Armenian and Syrian churches that have these have added them to their canon. They consider them scripture. Um... But the story is that in the Middle Ages, somebody found these documents in caves in Judea. Well, that's where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they translate them into Greek. They believe them. They put them in their canon. And But if that story is true, where are the Hebrew versions? Well, they're gone. Yeah, that's a really nice story, you know. So it was thought of as Christian fiction because these things, much like the Essene uh, concepts, it's way too Christian if you're thinking of Christianity as developing. so But what's interesting is with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have many of these, a good half of these um, are there. So parts of Levi, Judah, Issachar, Gad, many of these things, Benjamin. Now, but what's interesting, though, is we got the Testament of Levi, and that's probably the most important one to study as far as prophecy goes. Very interesting. Uh, but Levi's child was Kohath. Kohath was the father of Amram, Amram was the father of Moses and Aaron. So we actually have a good portion of Kohath, Amram, and Aaron's testament. And it's amazing to see Aaron, you know, if this is not tampered with, this is the testament of Aaron, telling his children that he, the prophecies are that they will err in the last days when Messiah comes and they will actually put Messiah to death. And if you want to be in God's grace, have nothing to do with the nails, whatever that means, because nobody was crucified at that point yet, um, or that it hadn't been invented yet. But 
seeing things like that all through the testaments is really amazing so let me just run through here real quick those are some of them in the book that we made is we have a prophecy outline and these are where they have so you've got the testament of jacob reuben simeon and so up here this first one is l4 right here so l4 is the testament of levi which here's levi chapter 4 and so that's how this works exactly and we have lots of quotes down here to kind of pull the prophecies together but just looking at this chart levi chapter 4 tells us that the messiah is called the son of god now we know that or we we surmise that through like psalm 1 and 2 and other places but uh, uh proverbs uh chapter 30 you know tell me god's name if you can and what is his son's name god has a son cool what is his name well it's a riddle if you can if you know tell me that's what it says in proverbs 30. um so anyway messiah is god's son or, or is called the son of god uh, the messiah is actually god incarnate now this is in simeon chapter 5 and 7 6 and 7 excuse me zebulun 9 naphtali 8 asher 7 and benjamin chapter 10. It's pretty interesting. Levi's priesthood would exist only until the Messiah comes. Then a new Melchizedekian priesthood would arise. This is mentioned in Reuben, Reuben 6, Levi 4 and 5, Benjamin 9. Levi's ordinances and sacrifices are only until Messiah. And that's mentioned specifically in Reuben 6. Um, the tribes would rebel against Judah and Levi. That's in Reuben six and dan five so i'll just go ahead and read these uh without the references uh messiah is supposed to be of the seed of judah we know that from scripture the messiah is virgin born that's in joseph 19. we worship the messiah well yeah if he's god incarnate we would be worshiping him so pretty interesting messiah is an everlasting king then how does he die it's a it's a mystery we'll figure it out when it happens but apparently there's a resurrection it's not you know it's got to be something like that but that's in reuben and joseph the messiah dies for us it fixes our relationship with god somehow according to what it says in reuben 6. there's a physical resurrection oh, that's easy that's all through the old testament the messiah brings salvation that makes sense the Levites are the one to crucify the Messiah. That's pretty interesting. Now, the Romans actually did it, of course, actually did that. But the Levites were the ones that were behind the scenes to make them uh, crucify the Messiah. Um, there would be two expulsions. And this is also talked about by the church fathers as they in interpret uh, Amos chapter 9. But it's interesting then if you understand that they get kicked out of their land as a whole. The nation of Israel ceases to exist in the Babylonian captivity, and then they come back and reestablish their kingdom or their nation again. They continue there until 135 AD with the Bar Kokhba rebellion, when they're kicked out of their country, and this time not in one spot in captivity, but ex an expulsion, and Israel ceases to exist until 1948 when they come back so if there's only two expulsions where the nation don't no longer exists that means next time you're going to have the believers fleeing probably to petra under the reign of the antichrist but the nation would still be there there will be an apostate government that sides with the antichrist allows the antichrist to sit in the temple you know etc but that's pretty interesting because the church fathers recognize this and they said if there's only two expulsions what you want to do is look at the prophecies in the old testament and look real close if it says when they come back from the land of the north or from babylon or from you know something like that then that's 536 bc sometime after that those prophecies are fulfilled when you see israel coming back from the four corners of the world from uh, all nations something like that then we know that's 1948 so those prophecies when it says when this happens then this you know that those prophecies are going to occur sometime after 1948 a.d 
And that's what's very important to compartmentalize the prophecies to understand them better. So it's interesting that way back when, Levi 15, Zebulun 9, Naphtali 4, and Asher 7, that there would be two expulsions in the land. They hadn't even really started yet. You know, they haven't went to Egypt yet. And, you know, isn't that amazing? But they have those that study the prophecies. Anointed with the Spirit will understand these things. The Messiah resurrects in Levi 16. So now we know how that happens. The Messiah dies for our sins. The Messiah resurrects. And then later on, in the next age, 2,000 years later, starts the kingdom. The Messiah ascends. The Messiah creates a new priesthood. Uh, that's in Levi 18 and Aaron 4. Now, think about this a minute. If the 12, the um, testaments of the 12, possibly being tweaked through centuries of Christianity, that's going to be the argument. Um, we have parts of them in Hebrew, which are pretty interesting, but maybe parts of them aren't. Right? That's the argument. Well, then if you set those aside and look at all of the other testaments, they don't exist anywhere as far as I know of in the world, except for the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is pre-Christian. So notice this. The Messiah creates a new priesthood is in Levi 18. Okay, maybe that's somewhat tampered with or mistranslated. But it's also in Aaron chapter 4. That's only in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So apparently, when Messiah comes and abolishes the Levitical priesthood and the temple is destroyed, he creates a new priesthood. Hey, Peter said something about that. We're a new priesthood, a royal nation, a peculiar people. Okay, I just thought it was interesting. Uh, the book of Enoch is mentioned as a legitimate book, not necessarily scripture. Nobody said scripture. I don't think anybody mentions scripture as a word back then. Uh, but the book of Enoch is part of the books of the ancestors. So Enoch is one of the patriarchs. And so we have that. The, the, uh, several people have asked me this too, that the because uh, I've made comments about the book of Enoch may not be 100% reliable in the Ethiopic. So they're like, well, but you translated it. So it's like, you know, how, how does this work? And what we're seeing is the, the pieces of Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls are almost word perfect with the the parts that are in the Ethiopic, and we have presumably most, if not all, and maybe some additions in the Ethiopic. But there's a few places where it's just slightly different, and it makes a lot more sense in the Hebrew Dead Sea Scroll version than that. There's very little to even go on, and even less that we could say is different. But it just lets you to understand that there's a difference. Book of Jubilees has got some interesting things in it. It's got a few things that contradict, not necessarily scripture, but contradict um, like a Jasher and a few other things. But the numbers are off. And so that tells us, for instance, comparing it to Genesis, you start off with creation. By the time you get to, uh, I for, forget where exactly, but it keeps getting off and off and off. And at one point, it's 300 years off the count with Genesis. But then something happens, and it kind of flips around and starts going back. So by the time you get to the birth of Jacob, it's only one year difference between that and Genesis. So really interesting. So that would be like 2000 and something, 2030, 40, something like that, when Jacob was born. Um, that'd be right. Jacob, yeah. Anyway, uh, whatever it is. But it's interesting to see that. So obviously somebody messed up the numbers and then somebody tried to fix it. Okay, so it, we just got to take everything with a grain of salt. But anyway, the fact that it's mentioned and the watchers and the history and the prophecies that are in the book of Enoch mentioned in Levi 16, uh, Judah 18, Zebulun 3, Naphtali 4, and Benjamin 9. So quite a bit. Uh, the writings of the fathers, and that's talking about the patriarchal writings mentioned in Zebulun 9 and Kohath chapter 2. Again, if you think that the 12 sons are, you know, you don't want to, 
possibly put doctrine into them because they may be corrupted through the Middle Ages. But what about Kohath? Just a Dead Sea Scroll, nowhere else on the planet. Um, the writings of the fathers existed. Okay, very interesting. The Messiah would appear in Zebulun or in the place of Zebulun. Remember, that's what it says in um, uh, in Matthew. So Matthew could be quoting Zebulun 9 as a prophecy. Uh, the New Jerusalem is mentioned in Dan 5. The Old Jerusalem is mentioned in Jacob 2. Um, the Watchers, the fallen angels in Enoch, it are mentioned specifically in Naphtali 3. So as you can see, everybody believed, no one believed Sethite Canaanite theory of Genesis chapter 6 until the middle of the 2nd century AD. So, and then that came actually from a Gnostic source that kind of got twisted around. So, long story. Anyway, Messiah's priesthood would be eternal, and that's found in Amram and in Aaron, two of them that are only in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So anyway, lots of other stuff in there. I just wanted to kind of show you that for this prophecy outline. Um, last thing I want to share with you is something from one of the church fathers. Yeah, we got time. And this is something, it's, it's from uh, a guy named Hippolytus. And to give you a basic background of him, um, the Apostle John um, had uh, disciples, one of which was... Um, Polycarp, and Polycarp's main disciple was uh, Justin Martyr, or the main two, and Irenaeus. And Irenaeus's main disciple was Hippolytus, so this guy here. So this is uh, four generations from John. Um, so, uh, so in and he writes a book called Refutation of Heresies. So John has problems with Gnostic cults. Polycarp does. Justin Martyr does, and then Irenaeus decides, we're going to fix this. I'm going to write down every cult that we have in our, in our country, starting, you know, and this is the weird stuff that they teach, and they get it from these verses, and this is what that really means, and here's verses that counteract it. So it's, a, it's an anti-cult thing. You guys probably remember Walter Martin, who wrote The Kingdom of the Cults, nice, fairly thick book on basic cults in the United States. So same kind of a deal. Well, after him, uh, Hippolytus or Hippolytus, uh, use different ways, but or pronounced different ways, but he writes refutation of heresies, basically does the same thing. Well, at one point in chapter, actually it's book nine, chapter 21, he starts talking about the divisions of each of the groups. And there's subdivisions of Samaritans, of uh, Sadducees and Pharisees and all these groups. Of interest to me, though, is the divisions of the Essenes. So when you get up to the time of Christ, the apostasy had overtaken the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Samaritans, the Bithians, um, the Zealots, the Sakari. You'd think everybody was messed up except the Essenes, you know, the one good group. No, apostasy always sneaks into every church. And maybe your church or your denomination is the perfect one. I don't think there is a perfect one, but let's just say it is. Probably about as close to perfect as you can get. That doesn't mean that if you go, you know, three or four towns down and you find a church that's one of yours and you walk in there that it's guaranteed to be absolutely perfect. You have weirdos, con artists that just kind of infiltrate. And that's why we've got to watch him. Or, or maybe that pastor seemed to be good, was trained properly, but now he's doubting his salvation, his doubting prophecy. Things happen. So what's interesting here is they said that there were four types. And basically, the last one here, number four, is called the ancients. And they, they called themselves this because they continue with the original pattern and they won't associate with any of the other three subgroups in any way. So the Essenes said, we follow the ancient testaments of the patriarchs, the ancient Old Testament, the old ways, the old paths, the way it was always done. These guys, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, have departed, 
And now in our ranks, there are people that are getting confused, miswriting, misreading scripture, and we're going to have to excommunicate them. Now, it's not so much of what they believed, but the, the um, heretic concept. And we usually think of a heretic as someone that doesn't believe like we do. But a heretic is actually a divisive person. So it could be something simple as baptism. Let's say you're, you believe in believer's baptism by immersion. And I'm thinking I was raised in a church that maybe sprinkles. And maybe it's a big deal and maybe it's not. I'll listen to what you got to say, but eh, I, my heart is just with my old church and eh, whatever. I'm not divisive about it. It's not a big deal to me. Uh, but I want to study with you. I love the Lord. In that case, you know, Paul talks about it. You know, in that case, you'd probably call me a weak brother. In the first Corinthians, it talks about you allow a weak brethren to come because if they want to study and they study, they will eventually figure it out. And you don't want to drive someone away from becoming a Christian, becoming a mature Christian. But if they come to church or to your Bible study, for the specific purpose of causing division, they have to be escorted out. That's just all there is to it because they're divisive. So it doesn't matter what we're talking about, but it's that heretic attitude. I know better and you will come to understand. You can leave now. And so that's what they're doing. But so these three groups then apparently got to the point that you have to do it my way. And that's when the um, excommunication happens. You have to boot them out of your church. So these three groups, it's really interesting. Well, I'm, I call the first group hyper-idolatry. The, the description from, from Hippolytus is that they would not handle coins or go into a city where there's images. Now, you can understand this, the concept that if you're not supposed to have idols, so they misunderstand the Old Testament, the laws of Moses about the idol, idolatry. If, and I think we all understand this, if I go into a museum and there's a statue of George Washington, the father of my nation, and it makes me want to study the Constitution, you know, and follow, you know, let everybody know I have rights and I'm going to be a First Amendment, Second Amendment, you know, start doing this stuff, then I'm a patriot, right? But I'm not worshiping. Um, George Washington. I don't pray in front of the statue. The statue is not an idol. It's just a statue. And the law very clearly says this. There's a, there's a section in uh, the uh, Maimonides um, writings that talk about the, it's called the Avodah Zara. It's about Gentile idolatry. And it very clearly says that if you walk into a city and they got a big statue of a king, and it's uh, labeled, you know, when they became a nation, they fought this big battle, and now they're a free people. And it's perfectly fine. It's not a big deal. But if they ever start gathering in front of that statue and praying to it, you're done. You walk out. You don't come back. Jews can't be around idols. So that's the concept. They go too far and say, no, if it's a three-dimensional image, it's an idol, period. So the a coin, it's stamped, right? So then the head is actually out of the coin just a little bit. It's an idol. There you go. You can't, can't handle coins, and you can't go into a city where there's images. Well, I'm sorry. I understand your conviction, but you're an idiot. You know, and that's basically what happened. And again, you might have someone feeling that way, which is to us is weird, but... You ought to be able to figure that out. It's, it's not hard. Remember they um, when the Sadducees asked Jesus about should we pay taxes to Caesar, he said, show me a coin. And they gave him a coin, and he didn't say, ooh, I can't touch that. It's got an idol on it. It's a coin. He picks it up and says, whose image is on this, Caesar? Then give it to Caesar. Okay, we're done. So hyper-idolatry. Um, everything is an idol. Everything is pagan. And so that's kind of a, we have people today inside the church, it's called pan-Babylonianism. Everything is pagan. You can't have a Christmas tree, for instance, because it's pagan. And no proof of that necessarily, but it's just pagan. You know, where you can't do this and you can't say these words and you, 
can it celebrate a holiday, that kind of stuff. Now, if it's an actual pagan holiday and you're going into a pagan temple and doing a pagan rite, that is that is sinful. We are not supposed to do that. But these guys mix misunderstand what is secular culture and what is idolatry. So hyper idolatry. The second group is called the circumcision party. And even Paul mentions the party of the circumcision. And it's cryptic kind of because in one sense, I could say the party of the circumcision, and I'm talking Jews, the party of the uncircumcision would be Gentiles. Okay, and that's cool. Nobody's mad at anybody. It's just a description, circumcision and circumcision. But the party of the circumcision, that became, in Acts chapter 15, it became the the uh, the Sakari and the Zealots getting together saying, you have to convert to Judaism to become a Christian. If you're studying Judaism and you don't convert, we have to kill you. I mean, it was an extremely hostile thing. So the basic idea is to force Gentiles who want to study the law to be circumcised or else murder them. And this was the Zealots and the Sakari. Zealots were people that were kind of above board. They want to raise an army and come in and just wipe you out and let everybody know this is what they're doing because they believe in what they're doing. The Sakari were assassins. Uh, they would rather have one person not risk killing hundreds of troops, but one person to slip in, kill the general, and slip out. That would be better in, in their mind. So um, zealots and, and Sakari or assassins. But understand this, if we understand, going back to here, um, the forced Gentile conversion, no, it is sinful. Pharisees, no, it is sinful. Sadducees, yes, if you're in Israel, you have to be. Noahide law goes along with that. No, the Gentiles follow Noahide law. They wait on Messiah. They do not follow Israeli ritual. So totally different. When you're circumcised, it means you have thoroughly converted to Judaism. And Paul actually says that if you, um, you know, like say you're a Roman, you're uncircumcised pagan Ro Roman uh, soldier, you're in Israel, you learn about Messiah, you understand it, you accept him as Messiah, you become a Christian, you're saved. Paul says under no circumstances do you get circumcised because you'd be de in debt to, to obey the law of the Jews, and that's not what God has for you. So the forced conversion of Gentiles, the party of the circumcision, it's the Acts 15 group. And then the third one is this hyper-blasphemy group. They basically are described as, uh, you can't call anyone Lord except deity. So in other words, anything that was... Um, the word Adonai has to refer to God. You can't refer to it as a person, or you can't mix. The, it's the sacred name concept. So there are people today that would separate from you or call you a pagan if you use the word Jesus. They would tell you that the word Jesus is Je Zeus, which has got something to do with the god Zeus. You know, things like that. And it's just, it's funny. It's like if these guys could learn to read Hebrew and Greek, it would be really nice. A lot of this stuff would fall away. Um, but anyway, you have to you have to word use words like Adonai, which is funny because Adonai is plural. The singular is Adon, which they would understand. But there is a Greek god, Adon, Adonis. So it's it's interesting that why why would they say this is pagan when that's not pagan? In in reality, it's just words. But it's it's really interesting to see this. So today. Uh, we would say Messianics, and follow the Dead Sea Scrolls in the New Testament, would be the ancient Jewish practices, the ancient beliefs of Messiah, and our hyper breakoffs, or almost cultic breakoff, and sometimes the divisive ones, would be the Pan Babylonians. The um, party of the circumcision would be um, not Messianics, but the hyper Hebrew roots groups. And the hyper-blasphemy groups would be the sacred name people. And it's perfectly fine to pray in the name of the Lord, to pray in the name of Yehovah or Adonai or whatever. He understands all languages. But to say that you have to pray with a certain word or God won't hear your prayer, that's 
that that's uh, a breakup time. If you do that and you let me pray in my way, that would probably be acceptable to them. But remember, they become a heretic when they become divisive. So if you, uh, like for instance, I have a, a Bible study on Tuesday nights and I go to a Calvary chapel. So if my pastor heard that I was teaching one of these things and came in and said, that's heresy. If you need to study it, we can sit down and talk. But you can't teach that and call yourself a home group of a Calvary chapel. Cannot do that. Is that understood? And if I said, look, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Well, then you're excommunicated. We are not going to be associated with that. We can't. It's not what we are. And so that's what they were doing. The Essenes were the ancients, and they would not be associated with any of the three. And you can see how far that goes. So we don't want to be pan-Babylonian, uh, hyper-Hebrew roots, or sa hyper-sacred name, which is really interesting. It's amazing that this would be written a couple of hundred years after the Lord, or 150 years after Jesus' time, and that we would begin to have the same kind of problems in our day. And again, with the Dead Sea Scrolls coming back, I think this is all pretty much nullified if you actually study them. So we'll stop there for today, but I just wanted to show you um, those things. So I'll go to the chat room now and see if we have any questions. Hey, I'm doing good. We started at 7 and it's only 8.06. So I'm not. Okay, Troy asks, um, twice this week I've heard references about Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Can you expand or comment on that? I don't know a whole lot about it. I think it was mainly started with um, um, Michael Heiser. And it's it's connected with the concept that uh, when the Lord divided the earth, he divided into 70 nations. And if you take that to mean there's 70 separate, like angels or principalities or some sort of spiritual beings that rule those places, um, then Israel has their own laws and their own governance and other people or under these other spirits. Um, you could take that a couple different ways. You could say like, well, that's why we, we don't want to be Israeli and they don't, you know, we shouldn't interfere in their politics or something like that. Uh, or you could take it in the, in the way that we are run by demonic entities in our nation, whatever nation we're in, you know, somewhere. So it could be, uh, there could be a lot of different ways of interpreting that, and I'm not sure really what he was talking about and how he interprets it may be totally different by someone else. A lot of these things get started and kind of get twisted into something other than what the person who named it uh, says. So I don't really know that much about it. I know that that's what it's based on. And there's probably some merit to that, the whole concept that... Uh, um, I think the Bible, or the King James Bible says the 70 nations um, divided by the 70 that came down, so the 70 sons of Jacob. And then uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls said the 70, I think, Elohim. So there's a bit of a confusion on who exactly we're talking about. Um, and even, even though who, it's like why 70, and what are the 70, and what's the point of that? But he has the concept of, um, um, I think what, what, what does he call that? The, the ca divine council. And the idea that the same thing, that there are angels or principalities that rule certain countries, and that's why things are different. And we'd have to understand that to be able to possibly even affect change. So I think that's probably what they're referring to, but how far they're taking it, I don't know. Cheryl says she's happy to be here. Well, I'm happy you guys are here. Glad that you guys like coming and studying with us. Just finished reading the Book of Enoch, working on the Seder Elam now. 
finding out a lot of holes in my understanding. It has a way of doing that to you. Yeah, you read that stuff and it's basically the same, but it's like, oh, that's how that got there. So it really helps. The Seder Alam is pretty interesting. It may have some errors in the in the in the dates also. It's it's a history book trying to put the dates together. And like Jasher, for instance, will simply say, it was in this year that this happened, done, like by with its own authority. The Seder Alam is a guy who's trying to say, well, the scripture says this, the rabbis say that, but this would have to be here. So it's pro, you know, and they're they're trying to prove or rebuild the timeline. Uh, so it's interesting, but it does tell us how um, and when this, the 160 some years missing in the Jewish calendar got taken away. So it's really interesting in that respect. Prescott sent us $20. Thank you very, very much. And then Dolores gave us uh, $10. Thank you very much. I totally have forgotten where the Nile drying up prophecy is. Um, let's look it up real quick. Uh, it's in Isaiah somewhere. <laughs> Does that help? Okay, let's, let's find it real quick here. Um, where would that be? Probably the easiest would be, I finally got all the PDFs of my books and in the way that it also has the, the, te the um, table of contents at the end. So our rapture book, and let's see here. I know it's in here somewhere. Let's see here. In here somewhere I have Dear Lord. And this is probably not it. Okay. Let me think here. Ah, here we go. Um, let's see here. What I did in this chapter, the revealing of the Antichrist, people talk about um, how the Antichrist could be revealed when he uh, enforces the covenant, or maybe he's revealed to everyone when he sits in the temple. And the concept is, if he's revealed when he sits in the temple, then there's probably a mid-trib rapture, which means we're still here, which means we would be screaming, he's the one, because we're looking at all the prophecies. So no matter how you look at it, he would be revealed at the beginning of the seven year period, which if he's revealed at the beginning, that means there's a pre-trib rapture. So it's just kind of interesting. And then to go a step further, people would say like, well, if you're confusing, I mean, if you're wrong and you tell people there's a pre-trib rapture, aren't you scared that it'll make them lose their salvation if it doesn't happen that way? And my answer is, well, maybe if that was the only prophecy in the Bible, but there's tons of prophecies and there's at least 10 that happen right there at the beginning. So if they see nine out of the 10, they'll immediately go back to the Bible and try to figure out how did we get that one wrong? Because it's obviously we're on to something if nine out of the 10 ideas came to pass. So, but one of them uh, temple being rebuilt. Let's see here. It should be right. Egypt destroyed. Okay, here it is. Uh, Zechariah 10, 11, and then Isaiah 19, 4 and 5 are the two. Zechariah 19 is what I was thinking. The Egyptians I will hand over into the hand of a cruel Lord, and a fierce king will rule over them, says the Lord. And this is probably talking about the Antichrist. Uh, the waters shall fail from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up. So the Nile River ceases to exist at that point. So this is a river in Egypt. It doesn't actually say Nile, but it leads us to believe that. We go back to Zechariah 10. Oh, you guys can't see this too well. 
Let me try this here a little bit. Hey, that's better. Okay, just read this one. And the Egyptians I will give over to the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king will rule over them, says the Lord of hosts. The waters will fail from the sea, and the river will be wasted and dried up. That's Isaiah 19, 4 and 5. And along with that is Zechariah 10, 11. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and smite the waves of the sea and all the deeps of the river shall dry up. The pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. So this is connected with Egypt. So we've got um, Egypt and the river drying up here and the failing of the sea and the river what rasted and dried up here. So two scriptures that talk about that. Some people try to say that it might be something else or something that's already happened, and that's a possibility too. It could be a double fulfillment prophecy, but that's where we get that at. So thanks for asking. And Anita says, oh, same one. She had, okay, so 19.5 and then Ezekiel 30.12. So it's in there again. We're on YouTube. No, I'm just heathen. Uh, yeah, it does, definitely. Um, and like a, two or three weeks ago, we looked at the um, commentary on Nahum, which described the Sadducees government structure. And that was pretty eye-opening, too. It's a lot like the some of the current things going on. Oh, the sneak, the chosen sneak peek, uh, episode two is tonight. He said he was going to start putting them out as soon as they were. So maybe sometime this, well, let's see, this is Monday. So sometime this week, then maybe we can all see, actually see that. That'd be cool. That is just a, an amazing type of thing. Uh, what I was thinking of when Jesus and John went in there and they said they're missing so much. Uh, you, you could look at that a bunch of different ways because, number one, I look at it immediately. It's like, yeah, they're, they're missing the rest of the Old Testament. Uh, the Pharisees rejected the apostles. They're missing the New Testament. We tend to have the same kind of a deal where it's like, yeah, don't add to our canon. So don't talk about Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, I'm not trying to add to the canon because they are separate canons and they're not really supposed to be added to. But the history of the Essenes... We really do need to understand it. Excluding Gentiles, what percentages of the people were Sadducee, Pharisee, and Essenes? I don't know that we can actually say that, uh, but there is a record that there were lots of Essene um, people, uh, synagogues and groups. Uh, so in other words, you could walk into a synagogue that's primarily Sadducee and, you know, that kind of thing, much like a church. I could walk into a church and uh, if I didn't know, you know, the symbolisms or could read the signs or whatever, it might, I might walk into a Catholic church or a Baptist church or whatever. Um, but there were supposed to be a lot of them. Along those lines, uh, people get confused because you could be a Pharisee, like Paul was a Pharisee. He followed the Pharisee beliefs, doctrines, and he, he could have been in the Sanhedrin representing that belief structure. But he was a Benjamite, so he couldn't have been in the temple. So you can be a Pharisee uh, and not be a priest. Or you could be a priest and believe like the Pharisee priest. And that's pretty obvious. The same with the Sadducees, too. You could be a Sadducee and be of the priestly tribe or a Sadducee and be someone else. 
So, but people get confused with the Zadok priests and the Essenes. The Zadok priests are the ones that are actually supposed to be doing priestly things in the temple. They're the real priests. The, the other groups were usurpers. Okay. But now, if I believed the Essene doctrine or the Zadok doctrine, I followed the Zadok priests. I don't think Sadducees and Pharisees are legitimate. I still wouldn't be able to go in the temple, do sacrifices or anything like that. I'm not a priest, a Zadok priest, but I am of that belief structure. So when we say Essenes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, we're talking about people that believe certain ways. And the Zadok priests and the non-Zadok priests are groups of people, you know, like higher up government type things. So that helps to understand it. Because people will say, well, if you were a scene, how could you be doing this? Well, they may not have been a priest. So just like Paul was a Pharisee, but he was a Benjamite. Regular, oh, okay. Diane says the regular schedule for episode two is tomorrow night. Um, I'll have to watch it on the app later because we have our Bible study tomorrow night. But that's cool. I will definitely watch it. I watched all of them so far. And everybody we've shown them to has just been like, oh, man, this is great. Oh, one of the things I was thinking of, though, is that uh, with Jesus and John talking about the, um, they're missing so much, only having the five books. Uh, we do have to be careful about that because uh, Catholics would take that as saying, see, they need to add the Apocrypha. Mormons would take it and say, see, they need to add the other books and things like that. So we've got to be careful of subgroups doing things. So we do not want to add to the canon, but we also want, don't want to make a, confuse the canons um, or ignore what was before Moses' canon, uh, the history of the, the 400 silent years, or like even church history afterwards. But we wouldn't put church history in the New Testament. So we do need to understand what is scripture and what is secondary. But we also don't want to ignore secondary information. I, I'm sure there is. The question is, are there any writings that would help uh, women out to be godly wives, uh, like the specific, like specific writings? Um, have a hard time finding things from women for women from that age. Yeah, that's very, very hard. Um, the Pharisees and Sadducees kind of had this at attitude that the women really shouldn't learn to read because if they could read, they would probably decide that they deserve rights too. And they, they, they had a really weird concept, well, much like we did, some of our people and some of our governments uh, way back when, when they wouldn't let women vote. Which is really interesting if you study the history. Women could vote, obviously. They're adults. Why wouldn't they vote? But then that right was taken away. Then it was put back. Then it was taken away again for different reasons. Then the 21st or 23rd Amendment, I forget, uh, allowing women to vote was put in the Constitution to, to guarantee it. It's really stupid that we have to have a constitutional amendment saying women are people. You know, it's just weird. But I'm glad we have it because it finally settled that stuff. But it's it's the funny way of doing things like that. So you you can't vote until you're an actually an adult, for instance. And a woman's not an adult until she's married. And when she's married, she's got to obey her husband. So we'll get rid of it that way. So then they said, no, no, 18. You're an adult at 18. Some country, some um, some states would actually say, you know, women can't vote and the guys can't vote until they're an adult. And they're not an adult until they actually own property. And their fathers won't let them own property until they come around to thinking like their father's dead. So there was a, a whole lot of weird stuff like that. And so finally it's like, no, they're an adult at 18. They can vote. It doesn't matter if they are a slave, used to be a slave, never were a slave. If they're a man, a woman, just leave it alone. And then there was the poll tax. Well, okay, everybody can vote, but it costs you, you know, a dollar. Poor people can't vote. They wouldn't do it. 
It's like, no, no, it's paid for by the government. It's free. There is no poll tax, period. So they keep having to go through this stuff all the time. Um, I don't know. My wife might have a better idea of something like that, too. Um, yeah, I don't know of anything specifically like from one of the ladies that wrote anything in particular. That would be a really, really good thing to help, I would think. Yeah, Diane says, Patriarchs is still her favorite book. Uh, it's got to be mine, too. Um, to actually see Jews 1 to 200 B.C. saying that's what proper doctrine is. And anybody that rejects it is cultic or heretic. And that would be Pharisees and Sadducees. And it's just amazing because they come back in Ezra's time and Jews are Jews. They just, you know, they speculate, but they're brothers. They don't, they don't divide. And then we go through the 400 silent years. You come up to the time of Jesus, and there's Sadducees and Pharisees and Essenes and all these groups, and they're all trying to kill each other. It's like, what in the world happened? So pretty, pretty amazing. So that tells us that something like that happens with our apostasy. Maybe not on the same doctrines, but something like that. The Antichrist can't have you say, well, you might be right, but the other guy might be right too. Well, we'll wait and see. Antichrist can't have that. And so we, we have to be um, tolerant in a, in a sense to make sure that people tolerate us and that we tolerate other people. And that doesn't mean to compromise. According to the Bible, you're wrong. Just, you know, just saying, or you are right or whatever. Chris says he loves the writings of Hippolytus. Yeah, they are some amazing things. We also put together the end times by the church fathers. And that was what Irenaeus said, Hippolytus, and then Ephraim the Syrian. Because they all wrote books. I say books. They're actually really small. So in the one book, we had all three of their books. But everything that they taught about the Ten, ten Nations, the Antichrist, stuff like that. And... Um, pretty interesting it's just their understanding or how they think it would happen and some of it might be right and some of it may not but they had some really interesting comments Yeah, that's a very good point. There will be a tribulation church, tribulation believers, people that become Christians or believers afterwards. And they will definitely know who the Antichrist is, so that's true. That's probably why it's written the way it's written. Uh, the Antichrist's name is 666. There's, there's some 80 prophecies about the Antichrist in the seven-year tribulation period. Um, and that most of that, we probably just scratch our heads. I have no idea what it means. But if we were here, we would know what it means. It would be pretty obvious. So part of that stuff would definitely be written to them. So yeah, and there's there's enough uh, understanding of uh, all the different things about the pre-trib rapture. Where do I learn about the Benjamites? Uh, depends on what you're talking about. There was the war in uh, that the Benjamites uh, did in Judges. Or is it Joshua? 
Judges or Joshua, anyway. Uh, if you're talking about the Testament of Benjamin, that's in the patriarchal writings. So that's in our, uh, let's see here. There we go. Uh, Ancient Testaments of the Patriarchs is this one here. This is our Bible Facts bookstore. Um, so, yeah, that's a good way to say it. We need to know the Bible books. That's the main thing, but they're not all that we need to know or that, that there is to know. Yeah, everything that you need to know for salvation is in the New Testament. But you would get confused on Paul's concepts of Hagar and Sarah and Abraham, you know, kind of the law being like that, if you didn't know who Abraham was. You know, and then there's things talked about that you just need to know other things. Like, for instance, have you ever wondered... Um, it talks about in Hebrews, Lot was a righteous man and he was vexed every day because of the wickedness of Sodom. I would imagine so, but where does it say that? It doesn't. So how does he know if he was really righteous, he would have been vexed? That's obvious. But some of us get complacent with um, sin and aren't so vexed for it. So where did he get that from? It's probably from either Lot or Abraham's Testament. So there's a lot of things in there like that that it would make a lot more sense. Is it possible to purchase your books outside of Amazon? Yeah, you can go to any bookstore. And, well, like, for instance, if you go, where were we at here? There we go. So like if you wanted this one, click on it here. You have down at the bottom somewhere. Okay. Here's the ISBN. So if you take the the title, which is, yeah, okay, just there's a 10 and a 13, so you might take both of them. But if you take the ISBN and then the title, it would be by Ken Johnson and then whatever the title is. And then just come down here and get this ISBN. Take that to any bookstore, and they should be able to order it. So it should be the same price, too. Apocalypse of Ezra and Gad are my favorite. Yeah, Gad is amazing. We need to go back and study those sometime. I just want to um, get all of the little idioms I can from the scrolls, then compile them. Then go back through the, the scriptures and those and see what we find. I think we'll learn some amazing things. Okay, and I think the last question we got at the moment is, um, I'm curious about the entire lineage and where the people and, well, where the people and when and what kind of thing. Okay. Um, yeah, the basic history then of all that. I'm still trying to put those together. We have the basic story of what happened, and we have a handful of dates that um, go along with that stuff. We know for sure that Ezra came, well, first uh, Cyrus freed the Jews in 536 or 537 BC. Then you've got Ezra and Nehemiah, the Nehemiah's... Um, decree that started the 400 the the uh, 490 year prophecy from that to the messiah was 444 bc and according to 11 q melchizedek jesus died in 32 a.d which means he was born in 2 bc 
Then we've got Herod pretty well, pretty well na nailed there. We've got the seven-year uh, civil war between the Pharisees and the Sadducees from 80 to 90 BC. And there's a handful of other things. Um, the invasion, well, the death of uh, Alexander the Great, 323. That's when most of this stuff really starts up. Uh, the commentary on Nahum talks about uh, the Sadducees beginning to form or had formed by that time. And they tried to get Demetrius, um, the fur Demetrius, what was his other title? Anyway, um, was ruling at the time of, of, um, of uh, Alexander the Great. So they tried to get him to actually in, come in to Jerusalem and take over. Uh, so it was interesting, that whole concept of trying to take anybody, any foreign power, no matter how pagan they might be, bring them straight into the temple, into, the, into Israel, so that they can take over and force everybody to do what I want them to. And so the people in a position of power would betray the law of Moses and kill anybody or do anything just to remain in power, allowing foreigners to come in and affect the government, either by force or the people, rather, by force. In, in our case, it could be a letting hundreds of millions of people in to vote just so that we can, you know, continue our power. So it's an it amazing concept taught in the, the commentary, the Dead Sea Scroll commentary of Nahum. So... But we're, yeah, we're trying to pull that together. We may not get a whole lot, but that in itself is a lot more than what I learned in seminary. A cemetery, we, a cemetery, <laughs> no, I didn't say that. That was a slip. But um, in seminary, you know, we tried to study all that stuff. I, I went to an, an amazing seminary. So that's, that was really great, uh, fun times. But um, there's just not much to go on until you get their history. And so it makes sense if, if people's kind of obliterated the history and made it real iffy, then the one guy's left to say, no, no, here's what happened and when. That's what we wanna really look at. So, okay, we'll go ahead and stop there. It's 8.30. And uh, we'll come back Thursday with a Q&A and then another teaching next Monday. So thank you all for um, participating. Have a good uh, rest of the week, and we'll see you on Thursday. God bless.